in the previous episode, introducing this series on mechanics, we talked about mechanical quantities, Q, which are different combinations of space, time, and matter, which is just an informal way to say that the dimensions of mechanical quantities are mass times length L to some power X and time T to some power Y. We saw that when X and Y are integers, the resulting mechanical quantities comprise all the usual suspects of physics, momentum, energy, power, action, etc. The last episode built a table of these standard mechanical quantities. We're very proud of this table because we think that it can be very useful for students, teachers, and researchers. But we must first learn how to use it. The key is to see that the mechanical quantities can be better understood by investigating the relationships that they have with one another. We started seeing a little bit of this when we said that a mass times a speed is a momentum, and multiply again by a speed and you get an energy. Divide the energy by a time and you get a power. Multiply the energy by a time and you get an action. Today we'll start by discussing the kind of relationship existing between quantities on the same line, like energy, force, stiffness, and stress. We will see that ratios of two such mechanical quantities generate what we call simple length. Take a mechanical quantity Q1 with an arbitrary length exponent x1 and a time exponent y. So the dimensions of Q1 are m l to the power x1 t to the power y, which could be any of the quantities from the standard table we were just talking about. Now take a second quantity Q2 on the same line that is with the same time exponent y, but a different space exponent x2. What will be produced by taking the ratio between q1 and q2? What would be the dimensions of such ratio? Well, we have to divide mlx1 ty by mlx2 ty. First, we notice that the mass dimensions cancel out, leaving only time and space. So like any ratio between two mechanical quantities, the ratio between Q1 and Q2 is a kinematic quantity, independent of the mass dimension. But since Q1 and Q2 are on the same line, this kinematic quantity is of a special kind. The time dimensions cancel out, leaving only space, so the ratio of Q1 and Q2 is what we can call a geometric quantity, with dimension of space to the power x1 minus x2. If we switch the exponent to the left-hand side, we see that we obtain a quantity with the dimension of a length. So the ratio q1 over q2 to the power 1 over x1 minus x2 defines a length, what we call a simple length, using this lowercase symbol l. If we need to be more precise in the notations, we will use the indices q1 and q2 on l to recall that it is the length constructed from the mechanical quantities Q1 and Q2. This episode is dedicated to the scope of this formula when choosing specific pairs Q1 and Q2 from the table of standard mechanical quantities. There are a lot of possible pairs, and we won't be able to talk about all of them. We will only discuss a few, and we invite you to suggest more examples of simple length in the comments with the hashtag simple length. This simple, almost trivial formula can be used to answer a profound question. Why do things have the size that they do? Where does the size of something come from? We can tell it's a deep question, because it sounds as one a child would ask. When we ask, what is the size of something, we do not ask about its apparent size, influenced by the perspective, but its intrinsic size. Even if from Earth you might be able to hold it between your fingers, the Sun is actually a hundred times bigger than Earth. The mean radius of the Earth is around 6,371 kilometers, whereas the Sun is almost 700,000 kilometers in radius. What sets the size of the Sun, or of the Earth, or the other planets and stars? This question is usually answered by considering the ratio between two specific mechanical quantities on the same line. Stress or pressure versus force density, what we call sigma and psi. 
the relationship between pressure and force density produces a simple length that can be used to explain the size of stars and planets in what is often called the hydrostatic equilibrium. Let's start from the general formula. The quantity on the right hand side is stress, sigma, so x1 is equal to minus 1. The second quantity is the force density, psi, so x2 is equal to minus 2. So the simple length built from sigma m psi is just sigma over psi. The size of an object governed by the interplay of stress and force density is just the ratio of the two. Since the stress or pressure or elastic modulus, sigma, is in the numerator, the greater it is, the greater the size L. In contrast, a larger force density tends to shrink the size, since psi is in the denominator. Let's take the Earth as an example. Where does the stress sigma comes from? The dimensions of the stress are m, l-1, t-2. So a stress can for instance be expressed in kilogram, meter-1, second-2. And 1 kilogram, meter-1, second-2 is what is called a pascal, a standard unit of stress or pressure or elasticity. The symbol is Pa. Different materials have different elastic moduli. Teflon has a modulus around 0.5 gigapascal, that is 5, 10 to the 8 pascals. Polystyrene has a modulus around 3 gigapascals. Wood is around 10 gigapascal. Concrete, 30, and steel around 200 gigapascals. The Earth has multiple layers with different moduli, but it is made of a third of iron, and its average modulus is around 100 gigapascals. That is 10 to the 11 pascals. Now, what about the so-called force density, psi? Its dimensions are m l minus 2 t minus 2, which is also m l t minus 2, divided by l cube, which is the dimensions of a force divided by that of a volume. And indeed, in the table, f and psi are on the same line, three cells apart. Psi is a force per unit volume. This is why psi is said to be a force density, in analogy with the relationship between m and rho, where rho is a mass per unit volume, or a mass density. The historical terminology can be a bit confusing, but the table helps getting used to it. So where does this force density psi come from? The stronger it is, the more the object shrinks. For the case of the Earth, what is the force that tends to shrink it? Well, that's gravity, right? The Earth's own gravity is what tends to shrink it. How do we estimate it? Gravity at the surface of the Earth is characterized by a constant acceleration g, around 10 meters per second square. The gravitational force of an object of mass m near the surface is f is equal to m times g. The force density is just rho times g. The mass density replaces the mass. And this equation remains true even within the Earth. Imagine a falling apple in a cave. Actually, this force density is even felt when no motion is possible, because it is blocked by other forces. The apple in your hand feels gravity just as much as when it is falling. So any arbitrary volume of the Earth feels the same force density. Just like the elastic modulus, the force density actually varies within the different layers of the Earth. But the average value of the force density on the whole Earth can be estimated by multiplying the reference acceleration g at the surface by the mass per unit volume of the Earth, that is, its density. The acceleration g is around 10 meters per second square, and the average density of the Earth is around 5 tons per cubic meter. So overall, the force density is around 5, 10 to the 4 kilogram, meter minus 2, second minus 2. Dividing our estimate of the stress by our estimate of the force density, we obtain a size around 2,000 kilometers. This is of course a rough estimate, neglecting most subtleties, but it is not too far from the actual reference value of 6,371 kilometers. For now, we will say that our estimate and the actual value have the same order of magnitude, 
and we will have to wait for another video to make this order of magnitude business more precise. Keep the formula, but think of the sun now. The force density of gravity can be estimated in the same way as rho times g, except that here, the acceleration at the surface of the sun is around 274 meter per second square, almost 30 times that of Earth. And the density of the sun is around 1.4 tons per cubic meter, which is a bit more than water, and a bit less than the Earth as a whole. Now, the radius of the sun is around 7, 10 to the 8 meters. If the size of the sun is due to the balance between stress sigma and the force density psi, the formula implies a particular value of the stress, which is around 2, 10 to the 14 pascals. To put this in perspective, this value is 200 times larger than the modulus of diamond, because this insane amount of pressure is due to the intense and continuous nuclear reactions occurring in the sun. We will return to the size of the sun and other stars in another video. This balance between sigma and psi is very useful in astrophysics, but the equation is not specific to large-scale objects. Actually, this equation is often called the hydrostatic equilibrium because it comes back to one of the earliest ways in which pressure was defined, from studies on the weight of liquids and gases in the 17th century. The pascal is a recent unit of pressure, introduced in 1971 as 1 kilogram meter minus 1 second minus 2, which is also equal to 1 newton per meter square, where the newton is the standard unit of force. The imperial equivalent is the PSI, that is pound per square inch. But there are myriads of other units of pressure, the atmosphere, the bar, the tor. The tor is named after this guy, Evangelista Torricelli. The tor is almost equal to the millimeter of mercury. The millimeter in this unit refers to a height, L, being measured as a proxy for pressure. Hg is the symbol for mercury, which comes with a density rho. Barometers like this one allow to measure the pressure sigma from a measurement of a length L. The density of mercury is 13,500 kilograms per cubic meter. The same device can be used with water and the pressure measured in millimeter of water. But since mercury is more than 10 times denser than water, finer variations in pressure can be measured more easily. In addition to the density rho, the acceleration of gravity g, around 9.8 meter per second square at sea level, produces a pressure sigma that is proportional to the measured height l. Pressure is measured by a length. This setup allowed Torricelli to measure the atmospheric pressure to be 760 millimeters of mercury. Mercury is more than 10,000 times denser than the air, so 760 millimeters of mercury can compensate for the weight of an atmosphere of a few kilometers high. A few kilometers of air generate the same pressure than 10 meters of water or a bit less than 1 meter of mercury. That is to say that 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere, also called one bar, and equal to around 10,000 millimeters of water, which is well known to scuba divers. The atmospheric pressure can also be converted in pascals, with one atmosphere equals 10 to the 5 pascals. So just like polystyrene, concrete, steel or diamond, the air itself has an elastic modulus. The modulus of diamond is about a thousand times that of polystyrene, which is itself 10,000 times that of air. So in the context of pressure, 10 to the 5 is actually pretty small. This simple formula, the hydrostatic equilibrium, marks the birth of the quantification of pressure. And since the 17th century, it has been used not only to discover the pressure of the atmosphere, but also to show that this pressure decreases with altitude, and to construct the first quantitative understanding of the atmosphere, its size, structure, and composition, forming the basis of meteorology. The book The Invention of Air by Stephen Johnson tells this story beautifully. Well, we have to stop here with the hydrostatic equilibrium because we've got a lot to cover. You can take a break now if you need to, but we gotta keep going, because this great formula, the hydrostatic equilibrium, is just one 
single example. It is a spatial case of stress sigma equals length L times force density psi, since the force density psi can be unrelated to gravity. Psi is a force density, not necessarily a weight density. When a situation is characterized by a pressure, stress, or modulus sigma, and a force density psi, the length sigma over psi will usually be of some significance, be it to understand the height of a column of mercury or the size of the sun. But this formula is but one example of simple length, in the case where q1 is sigma and q2 is psi. And there are a lot of other possibilities. Let's keep the force density, but now pair it with stiffness instead of stress. In the context where this pair shows up preeminently, the stiffness is usually called a surface tension, and the force density is once again a weight density. The pair gamma and psi produce what is called the capillary length. This capillary length is used to describe the size of a microcosm, that of a droplet, like this one, photographed by Marcus Rugel, reflecting a world map in the background. What sets the size of droplets? Why does the droplet of dew fall when its size gets over a limit? What is this limit? Droplets can have a variety of sizes, but above a critical value, they fall when hanging, and they form puddles when on the ground. This critical size is what's called the capillary length. Here, the two mechanical quantities are the force density psi and the surface tension gamma. And since they are two columns apart, the simple length has this one-half exponent. This length started emerging in the 17th century, following the development of the mercury barometer we talked about. Meet the Irish chemist Robert Boyle, who was involved in the history of this simple length. Stimulated by the development of the hydrostatic equilibrium, his mind was on the rise of various liquids in glass tubes, called capillaries, when particularly small. You remember the mercury barometer? Here, the column of mercury rises because the base is pushed on by the atmospheric pressure at the surface of the fluid that is in contact with the air. This can only happen because of the vacuum at the top of the sealed tube. Without any pressure at the top, the pressure at the bottom can only be balanced by the weight of the column, and nothing else than that. What happens if you open the tube at the top? The atmosphere would push at the top just as much as on the bottom, and so the level of mercury in the tube should be the same as outside, right? Well, not exactly. As you know, the fluid surface can slightly deform close to the tube, forming menisci. For a glass tube and mercury, the meniscus would bend downwards, but you're probably more used to water, which would bend upwards under the same conditions. This phenomenon was particularly intriguing to Boyle and his generation. They noticed that if you use different materials for the tube, you could even reverse the observation, switching the concavity of the menisci between water and mercury. Obviously, the surface tension, gamma, which they were uncovering, was dependent on the interaction between the fluid and what surrounded it. On top of this, the height of the rise or fall of fluid depends on the lateral dimensions of the capillary. Take here water in two glass tubes with different radii. Water rises more in the narrowest tube. James Jurin is the English scientist most often associated with this. In the early 18th century, he discovered that the height h was connected to the diameter d by what is now called Durin's law. The area of contact between the fluid and the tube is proportional to the mechanical ratio between the surface tension gamma and the force density psi. The area of contact is proportional to h times d, so hd is the square of the capillary length. Durin's law and the capillary rise can also be used to measure surface tension gamma, as rho g that is the weight density, times h times d, the area of contact. Since all terms are constant for a particular fluid and tube, the associated surface tension is constant. The actual formula should include a few numerical factors, but they are beyond our point today. For water, the surface tension at the air interface is around 7, 10 to the minus 2 kg per second minus 2. So we can compute the capillary length for the air-water interface. The force density is rho g, 
with the density rho around 1 ton per cubic meter, and the acceleration g around 10 meters per second square. So the capillary length is around 3 millimeters. Below this size, drops are spherical and they flatten if larger, becoming increasingly like pancakes or puddles. Drops with sizes below the capillary length are negligibly affected by their own weight. And this battle between gravity and surface tension is also quite clear in a familiar sight. Alright, so we've seen psi and gamma with the capillary length, and we saw psi and sigma, the stress, with the hydrostatic equilibrium. Let's keep the force density psi for one more example along this line. Let's go far out and pair psi with an energy E. We're getting used to this. E and psi are now four cells apart on the same line, so they produce a simple length with an exponent of a quarter. This length has found some use in a few places, from craters to Brownian particles. You recognize the moon. The size of the moon can be obtained by the hydrostatic equilibrium, once we know its surface gravity and its mean elastic modulus. That is not what we're interested in here. We want to know about the craters on the moon and how the size of each crater is connected to the energy of the impact. Well, the higher the energy, the bigger the crater. That's something intuitive. Facing this energy is the weight per unit volume of the ground material being excavated. Here again, the force density psi is rho times g, the weight density. But the acceleration of gravity must be the one on the particular astronomical body on which the crater is formed. If the crater is on Earth, then g is around 9.8 meter per second square. On the Moon, g is around 1.6 meter per second square. If you do the math, you'll see that for the same energy E and density rho of the ground, the crater will be around 60% bigger on the Moon than on the Earth, since gravity is much weaker there, and that gravity is the limiting factor. Let's take the meteor crater in Arizona as an example. This impressive crater was formed 50,000 years ago by the impact of a meteorite. The crater is around 1.2 kilometers in diameter. If indeed the crater is due to a balance between the energy input E and the weight density rho g, then we can estimate the energy of the impact by knowing the size of the crater. We take the diameter as L, but maybe the radius would be better, so keep in mind that the results that we're going to obtain is a rough estimate. For the density, we take 2 tons per cubic meter, which is pretty reasonable for these types of soils, and 9.8 round up to 10 for the acceleration of gravity. This gives an energy around 4, 10 to the 16 joules, which, if you've seen our series on explosions, you know that it is equivalent to the energy of 10 megatons of TNT, which is typically the yield of the biggest nuclear bombs in the arsenal. For this crater, E came from the kinetic energy of the impactor, but similar craters form when the energy is that of a bomb, as in the Storax Sedan nuclear test of 1962. The 100 kiloton nuclear explosion excavated more than 6 million cubic yards of Earth in a matter of seconds. The result was a crater more than 1,200 feet in diameter, the length of four football fields, and 325 feet deep, the height of a 32-story building, created in less time than it takes to describe it. The bomb was detonated 200 meters below ground with an energy of 100 kilotons of TNT so 100 times smaller than the meteor crater impactor. Producing a crater around 400 meters in diameter. So the energy is 100 times smaller than that of meteor crater, and the size is about 3 times less. This is indeed what is expected from the formula, since 3 is around 100 to the power of 1 quarter. The simple length built from the ratio of energy and density is very useful to understand craters, but the dynamics of the cratering process are very rich, and an active subject of research, investigating craters made by all sorts of explosions or impact in solid, liquid, or granular media. We plan on returning to this topic in a future series. Maybe it's already out there by the time you see this. If not, don't hesitate to leave us comments with the hashtag craters 
to point out existing or ongoing studies on this topic. So far, we've used this formula to understand craters, where the force density is a weight density rho g, and where the energy E either comes from the yield of an explosion or the kinetic energy of an impactor. However, this simple length has a range of usefulness going beyond craters, and it can be used to describe what's called the average height of Brownian particles in sedimentation or centrifugation. Here, the particles are microscopic objects under the influence of some uniform acceleration, like the gravitational field, and also subject to thermal forces. These forces kick the particle in all directions, whereas the gravitational fields pulls in one direction only. For small enough particles, called Brownian particles, gravity is not strong enough to significantly pull on the particles, so sedimentation does not take place. The threshold size below which a particle will be Brownian can be expressed using the simple length associating energy and force density. Here again, force density usually comes from gravity, so psi equals rho g. The energy E is now the thermal energy, which can be expressed as the product of the Boltzmann constant Kb and the temperature theta in degree Kelvin. This thermal energy comes from the kinetic energy of molecules, so it is quite small, around 2 10 to the minus 21 joules at room temperature. Let's take the example of a particle of dust, with a density rho around 1 gram per cubic centimeter, so 10 to the 3 kilograms per meter cube and the acceleration g is around 10 meters per second square, the standard on the Earth's surface. The resulting size is around 1 micron, so dust particles in the air will be Brownian if less than 1 micron, and will fall down if they are bigger. For particles embedded in a fluid with significant density, the formula can be tweaked a little bit to take into account buoyancy, so the density difference between the particle and the fluid is used. For centrifugation, the effective acceleration can be orders of magnitude larger than the gravitational value. So one may use r times omega square instead of g. That is the centrifugal acceleration associated with a rotation frequency omega and a distance r to the axis of rotation. Overall, the size of Brownian particles can be tuned with some leeway. But we won't get into the details here because it's time to talk about a new simple length. We've just seen E and psi, energy versus force density. Let's keep the energy, but pair it with a stress slash pressure slash elastic modulus. This fourth example of simple length can be used in a variety of contexts, from explosions to biology and cells. We know how this works now. The energy E and the stress sigma are three cells apart on the same line, so the exponent is 1 over 3. We'll take two examples, when the energy is large, as in explosions, or when it is tiny, associated with the thermal energy. First, explosions. We won't give too much detail, since we have a whole series on this. The front of the explosion initially moves, but after a few seconds, the blast reaches a final radius, and the dust stops there. This is an aerial view of the Buster shot, from Operation Buster Jangle in 1951. The energy of the nuclear bomb was equivalent to 31 kilotons of TNT, which is around 10 to the 14 joules. The simple length can be used to estimate the radius of the explosion, while the generated so-called overpressure will be higher than a few atmospheres. For E, we use the value of energy given by the yield of the bomb. For sigma, we use the atmospheric pressure around the explosion which we know to be one atmosphere, that is 10 to the 5 pascals. This produces a length around 1 kilometer, which is the radius of the area where total destruction is to be expected for a bomb of this yield. Check out our series on explosions if you want to know more about this ghastly business. Just like any other simple length, this one is not specific to a particular scale or context. It is useful for gigantic nuclear explosions, but it can also serve to understand the size of small stuff, even microscopic. For instance, as in the case of the length depending on the energy and force density, we can consider the case where the energy E is the thermal energy, around 2 10 to the minus 21 joules at room temperature. 
if for the stress sigma we use the atmospheric pressure, then the simple length is around 3 nanometers. What is this length scale? Well, it is the order of magnitude of the distance between the air molecules. Let's go back to the formula to understand this more clearly. We can rearrange the terms to define a pressure as E divided by L cube. We drop the indices on L since we know which length we're talking about. So pressure or stress or elasticity can be understood as a density of energy. And indeed, stress is three cells on the left of energy. Just like rho, the mass density, is three cells on the left of the mass m. Back to the formula. We were talking about the special case where E is the thermal energy. This is what is often called the ideal gas law, where the symbol used instead of sigma is usually P, and when 1 over L cube is understood as the number density, N, which is indeed 1 over the volume occupied by one of the microscopic constituents of the gas. This formula is called the ideal gas law, but it goes far beyond ideal gases. It is a way to translate a macroscopic thermal energy over a length scale L to a pressure slash stress slash modulus sigma. It can be used in solids, liquids, gas, and in all sorts of complex materials like polymers. For instance, if E is the thermal energy at room temperature, plugging different sizes L give rise to different orders of magnitude of stress. For instance, let's assume L is around 10 to the minus 10 meters, that is 1 angstrom, which is a typical atomic size. Then the stress sigma is in the gigapascal range, like polystyrene. You can play this game on your own, just plug in a length L, compute the stress associated with the thermal energy, and see if you can find a context where such stress is relevant. Let us know what you find in the comments with the hashtag energy and stress. Alright, enough with this simple length built from energy and stress. Let's talk about energy and stiffness slash surface tension. E and gamma are two cells apart on the same line, so the exponent is one half. No surprise there. Let's try to go over this one a bit faster because it's getting late. This equation can be used to describe the thickness of liquid films, like this familiar oily film. How to find the thickness of a liquid film? The energy E depends on the type of interaction between the fluid and the substrate. For instance, when the interactions are due to van der Waals forces, E is called the Amaker constant. A typical value is around 10 to the minus 19 joules. On the other end, a typical value of surface tension for an oily liquid is 30 millinewton per meter square, which is 3 10 to the minus 2 kilogram per second square. So the order of magnitude of the film thickness would here be in the nanometer range. Of course, different fluids on different substrates lead to different energies and surface tensions, so the length can vary depending on the situation. When the film is in the nanometer range, this meant that it is close to the molecular size. Actually, one of the first methods to estimate the molecular size precisely used thin films of oil and water. In this clip, Greg Kesslin performs the experiment, dropping a tablespoon of oil on the surface of a lake and measuring how far it spreads. You can watch the full video on his channel called What's the Physics? The idea comes back to Benjamin Franklin who marveled at the calming effect of the oil, which suppresses the waves on the surface. We'll talk about this phenomenon another time. What we will focus on now is how the tablespoon spreads. We start with the volume, the tablespoon, and we end up with a thin film of height L, covering a circular patch. So the length L can be measured by dividing the volume of the tablespoon by the area of the patch of oil, which is around half an acre, one tablespoon is equivalent to 1.5 10 to the minus 5 cubic meters, and half an acre is around 2,000 square meters. So overall, the predicted thickness is in the nanometer range. This experiment was first conducted quantitatively by Lord Rayleigh at the end of the 19th century. So the oil patch, once it has spread to its final radius, has a height given by the size of the molecules themselves. These molecules are lipids made of a number of atoms, the building blocks of nature that such kind of experiments help to unravel. Not only constituting the molecule of the oil, 
but also those of the underlying water. The simple length we turn to now can be used to estimate the size of the atoms themselves. The simplest atom is that of hydrogen, with one proton and one electron. This drawing is of course a gross oversimplification, but it will suffice for our purpose. The atom is here depicted as some kind of macroscopic solar system, where an electron, like a planet, orbits around the sun, the proton. Most in this drawing is wrong, like the proportions. Since the proton is actually much, much, much smaller than the size of the electron shell. But we don't care about the structure of the atom, just about its size, around one angstrom, that is 10 to the minus 10 meters. We would like to know if this size can be understood as a simple length. To answer this question, we can turn to a simplified but insightful model, the Bohr model, named after Niels Bohr here. In 1913, Rutherford and Bohr put together a model of the hydrogen atom based on the combination of the kinetic energy of the electron and the electrostatic interaction between the electron and the proton. How to express this interaction? Well, this is the good old electrostatic interaction between a negative charge, the electron, and a positive charge, the proton. Both carry a unit charge E. The force between them is that given by Coulomb's law, which decreases with the square of the distance between the charges, which is usually called R, but which we will call L here. Both the elementary charge E and the Coulomb constant K E are constant, so it is useful to combine them into a single constant approximately equal to 2.3 10 to the minus 28. The units still need to be sorted out. The C for Coulomb is the charge unit, which cancels out. The N stands for Newton, which is a unit of force, which is equivalent to kilogram meter per second square. We can then combine all meters together to get kilogram meter cube per second square. This universal constant, which we call S note, gives the characteristic strength of the electrostatic interaction between two elementary charges. The Coulomb force is then S note divided by L square. S note is a mechanical quantity. It can be found on the right of energy in the table. In the context of solid mechanics and the bending of beams, a quantity with the same dimension is sometimes called the flexural rigidity. But we've just seen that it is also at the heart of electrostatics. We call it strength for lack of a better name, but feel free to suggest alternative names in the comments with the hashtag strength. Back to the Bohr model. We have a pair of mechanical quantities in hand. First, the kinetic energy of the electron, E. Second, the strength, S, of the electrostatic interaction. In the table, both E and S are on the same line. So they combine to form a simple length. Now the energy appears in the denominator, since indeed S is on the right of E. For a given pair of mechanical quantities, the one in the numerator is always the quantity that is the most on the right of the table, that is, with the highest exponent of the space dimension. Speaking of which, the order in the indices of L does not matter, ES or SE. Anyway, the formula is set by the dimensions. As a habit, we tend to put the numerator first and the denominator second. So the larger the kinetic energy of the electron, the smaller the atom, because a larger kinetic energy means a higher tendency to fly off. And of course, the stronger the electrostatic interaction, the bigger the atom can get. For hydrogen, the strength S is S note. It is a fixed constant. We can now ask ourselves, what about the kinetic energy of the electron? Well, it is proportional to the product of the mass of the electron, m, and its speed, v, where the approximate equality underlines the fact that we've dropped numerical factors, like one half in the kinetic energy. We're only looking for estimates, not precise values. What is the speed of the electron, then? This whole thing is, of course, quantum and the electron is not really an object like a tennis ball or a planet would be. But a number of experiments in the early 20th century had obtained a sort of average semi-classical speed of the electron, 
usually expressed in units of the speed of light c. The proportionality constant alpha has no dimension. It is called the fine structure constant, and its value is around 1 over 137. So overall, the semi-classical speed of the electron in the hydrogen atom is around 2,000 km per second. By the time Bohr put his model together, the mass of the electron had also been measured to be around 9.1 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And we know S note. So putting everything together, the estimate for the size of the hydrogen atom is around half an angstrom. So the angstrom is the typical diameter of an hydrogen atom. In standard units, the Bohr radius is around 5 10 to the minus 11 meters. So the simple length built from a strength and an energy can be used to estimate the size of an atom. But like any simple length, it is not specific to this context. It depends on what you put in for the strength S and energy E. For instance, the thermal energy can be considered for E. For the strength, we can still consider the electrostatic interaction, but permeated through a medium reducing the strength in comparison to the vacuum. The strength can be expressed as the reference strength S note in vacuum divided by a number greater than 1. This number, epsilon r, is usually called the relative permittivity, or the dielectric constant associated with the medium between the two charges. This length is the Björm length. It is the distance over which the thermal energy overruns the electrostatic interaction. For room temperature in water, the Björm length is around 1 nanometer. To quote Wikipedia, this length scale arises naturally in discussions of electrostatic, electromagnetic, and electrokinetic phenomena in electrolytes, polyelectrolytes, and colloidal dispersions. Check it out. This length is named after another distinguished Danish scientist named Niels. Both formulas refer to the electrostatic strength, but using different kinds of energies. If you're familiar with this topic, you might be unsettled by our notation. So let's see how to recover the more familiar formula. First, the strength S note is just the product of the Coulomb constant and the square of the elementary charge E. For reasons that go beyond our scope today, the Coulomb constant is usually written as 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, which is the vacuum permittivity. And usually T is used for the temperature, but we stick to theta since we want to avoid any confusion with the dimension of time T. If we perform the same translation of constants for the Bohr radius, this is what we get. So, the Bohr and Burem length are both examples of length that can be built from a ratio of a strength and an energy. We've also seen energy and surface tension with thin films, energy and stress with explosions and variations of the ideal gas law, energy and force density with craters and Brownian particles, surface tension and force density with the capillary length, and stress and force density with the hydrostatic equilibrium and the size of planets and stars. All these pairs were located on the same line in the table. But of course, simple length can be built on any line of the table. We'll skip the other possible length that could be built on this particular line of time exponent minus 2. And we can jump instead to an example on the line just above, for instance, with the ratio of action and momentum. This will give us the opportunity to re-examine the Bohr radius from a different perspective. So far, we've seen the Bohr radius as the ratio of strength and energy. And we could also express the speed v of the electron from the speed of light c and the fine structure constant alpha. If we want to dig deeper, we can ask where this so-called structure constant comes from. It can actually be connected to the most famous example of action, the Planck constant, which can be understood as the quantum of action, or the quantum of angular momentum. The quantity was first used by Max Planck at the end of the 19th century to make sense of the data on the black body radiation. In the following years, the same constant started popping out everywhere in studies of light and the atomic scale. We use the so-called radius form of the constant because it has such a distinctive symbol, the H with a stroke, which can't be confused with anything else. This Planck constant is around 10 to the minus 34 kilogram meter square per second. 
so the dimensions are m l square t minus 1, which is indeed an action or angular momentum depending on perspective. What does it have to do with the fine structure constant? With the development of quantum mechanics, it became obvious that action and strength were connected by a speed. This is quite clear in the table, since they are on a diagonal of slope minus 1. So if you multiply the plane constant h, an action, with the speed of light c, you get a strength s h. How does this strength compare with the electrostatic strength s note? Well, that is precisely what the fine structure constant answers. So the strength built from the plane constant and the speed of light is around 137 times greater than the electrostatic strength. S note is the strength of the interaction between the positive nucleus and the negative electrons, whereas SH is usually interpreted as the strength of the nuclear interaction between the constituents of the nucleus. Back to the Bohr radius, we can replace the fine structure constant by its expression depending on the Planck constant to get this big mess, which simplifies to this expression. And if you don't like the whole 4 pi epsilon thingy, you can backtrack a little, use this equation again, and get one more equivalent expression of the Bohr radius. And alpha c is the speed of the electron. So we can write the Bohr radius as the ratio of the action h and m times v, which is the momentum p of the electron. And voila, we've turned the Bohr radius into a simple length based on action and momentum. Written in this way, the Bohr radius appears as the de Broglie wavelength of an electron of momentum p. If you know quantum mechanics, you'll recognize this formula. If you don't, it's not a problem for now. What you can appreciate is that the atomic radius can be expressed as a strength over an energy or as an action over a momentum. And this versatility is not unique to the atom, and we will discuss this redundancy of the mapping between kinematic or geometric quantities and mechanical ratios in a future episode on this series. Now, in between Bohr and De Broglie, we've seen that the simple length based on action and momentum has some famous applications. What else? One more example of simple length on this line. Let's keep the action and pair it with viscosity. Viscosity and action combine to form a simple length, allowing to understand the viscosity of a fluid as a density of action. And indeed, the two quantities are three cells apart, so the viscosity can be interpreted as a density of action, producing a simple length, action, divided by viscosity to the power of one-third. Different fluids can have different viscosities, due to different microstructures connected to L, and different magnitudes of action H. One particularly telling scenario is when the action takes its minimal value, H bar, the quantum of action. Take water as an example. In normal conditions, the viscosity of water is around 10 to the minus 3 kilogram meter minus 1 second minus 1. So the associate length would be half an angstrom. We get the atomic length again. The viscosity of water is the density of action equal to one quantum of action per atomic volume. Check a 2020 study by Trashenko and Brashkin for more on this fascinating topic. Alright, time to wrap this up. We've given eight examples of simple length, which is only a fraction of the possible pairs we could make from this table. We invite you to suggest more examples of simple length in the comments with the hashtag simple length. We have a few others in mind already, but this video is already way too long. So let us conclude with one last simple length, that produced by pairing a mass m and a density rho. Obviously this pair produces a length, one that seems comparatively trivial, but is it so? Mass and density are three cells apart on the same line, so the associated simple length is m divided by rho to the power of one-third. This equation is more often seen as a definition of density, as the mass of an object divided by its volume, which we call omega, so as to not confuse it with an speed v out there. 
So the simple length based on m and rho is really the cubic root of the volume omega. If the volume is a sphere, then omega is well known. It is 4 pi over 3 times r cubed, the radius of the sphere. So l is around 1.6 times the radius of the sphere. It is the side of a cube with the same volume. Now, what if the object has a complicated volume, like this gold nugget? It's not a sphere or a cube or any shape with well-known formula for the volume. In this case, the ratio of mass and density can be used to measure the volume omega and its cubic root L. The density itself can be measured with a volume of the same material, shaped into a simple shape, like this cube. For gold, the density is 19 times that of water. This simple length was probably one of the first historical examples of its kind. It goes back to the ancient geometrical roots of mechanics, and to Archimedes in particular, a story we will tell another time. One reason why this simple length seems simpler than the others is precisely because it's been around for millennia. But it remains relevant and it shows up in many modern applications. When the mass m and the density rho comes from the same material, the length seems pretty trivial, but the mass and density can also come from different materials. Take this supernova remnant. It's Tycho supernova, the still evolving remnant of a supernova explosion, first observed in the sky in 1572, across the globe, and in particular by the astronomer Tycho Brahe, yet another famous Danish. Back then, the nova manifested itself quite unmistakably as a new star in the constellation of Cassiopeia, the big W in the sky. This new star was quite bright, but gradually faded away, until it disappeared from view after a couple of years. Pointing a modern telescope in that direction now, and this is what you see. Back in the 16th century, the remnant would have been much smaller, but in the four and a half centuries since the progenitor star of the supernova exploded, its blast has extended dramatically, the scale that you see in the lower left corner is one parsec, a unit around 3 light years. To give you a sense of scale, one parsec is more than 200,000 times bigger than the distance between the Sun and the Earth. What does this gigantic thing have to do with the good old simple length between mass and density? Well, this supernova is at a critical juncture in its evolution, because the mass of the interstellar medium pushed by the blast is around the mass of the progenitor star. In this particular context, the mass m is that of the progenitor star. For this type of supernova, it is around the mass of the Sun, which is around 2, 10 to the 30 kilograms. What's the density of rho? Even if we tend to think of the interstellar space as empty, it's not exactly empty. There are still some atoms out there, although much, much less than in a glass of water. The density of interstellar space can vary from place to place, but a good order of magnitude is one atom per cubic centimeter. Since most of these atoms are hydrogen atoms, this translates to a tiny density around 10 to the minus 21 kilograms per cubic meter. Putting everything together, the resulting size is around 10 to the power 17 meters, which is about 4 parsecs. So four and a half century after the star one supernova, its remnant has grown to its critical size, pushing as much mass of interstellar space than the solar mass initially ejected. The expansion won't stop there, but this simple length marks the transition from the initial phase characterized by a fairly constant expansion speed, around 10,000 km per second, to a later phase where the speed will gradually decrease. This is true of supernova like this one, and actually for a large range of explosions, large and small. We discuss this in detail in the series on explosions. So here we are, we've been talking about pairs of standard mechanical quantities on the same line for quite some time now. All these simple lengths have the same general form. They are built as ratios of two mechanical quantities. For a given pair, one is always on top, in the numerator, the one on the rightmost side of the table. These simple lengths are a first step but they already allow us to understand how mechanical quantities on the same line can be geometrically related. In the next episode, we'll talk about quantities on the same column, 
producing simple times. The episode after that will talk about simple speeds for quantities on the same diagonal of slope minus 1. We will then be ready to tackle any pair of quantities, producing more complex spatiotemporal relationships, like energy and density, which is the basis for the explosion series. And eventually we will be ready to talk about lengths that are not simple, that is not built just from a pair of quantities, but from more. For instance, can we build the length from the trio of density, viscosity, and surface tension? If you've seen the series on droplets, you already know the answer is yes. Alright, that's it with this video. Thanks for watching and please click on the links if you're ready for more.